Uh, let me begin by thanking CES. Well, what a wonderful platform Great Minds is, and, and so good to be back uh, on the platform. Um, I'm also delighted to actually thank CES for embracing human security for all. I'm part of the World Academy of Art and Science, um, who are the campaign leads for human security for all. And this is a campaign launched with the support of the UN's Human Security Unit. And it's profoundly important, especially in this time, as we all know. Every day when you open the news, you're seeing something which makes you wish that there was human security for all. And the introduction you just saw, I think, is, is exactly what we aspire to do, to see if we can introduce human security for all um, everywhere in the world. Today's panel, therefore, is quite an important one. We will talk about technology as a force for good, and I'm also here as the chair of a foundation which looks at technology and capital and works with stakeholders um, to see if each of us, collectively and individually, can be a force for good in making the world a better place. Um, we are launching our report, Technology as a Force for Good, um, and how the world can become uh, a more sustainable, more secure, and superior world uh, through the use of technology. And that report gets launched and released at midnight today. And uh, we'll give you a little taster of it. And I'll present and walk you through that. Um, and then I'm going to introduce my two colleagues and friends here uh, with, who have some fantastic backgrounds, some real depth in technology for policy, um, for entrepreneurism, uh, and really for impact in the world. So I'll, I'll begin with the big picture, which kind of says the space race is, is something we all know of and all relate to as one of the greatest endeavors of mankind, a competition between two countries. The challenge we face looking ahead, of course, is far, far bigger than that. The space race is in, in comparison was simple. The amount of money it needed was simple. To solve human security for all, to deliver the UN Sustainable Development Goals, to level up the world, and to create the platform that we can use to launch into the next generation of technology, really, something that's much more prosperous, much more peaceful, um, is, is the real challenge ahead. And that requires every single country to cooperate. Uh, and what a difficult challenge. Two countries competing achieved the space race. And today, mobilizing every single country is the challenge. We are, and you'll see this in our report and in our work, um, at the end of one civilization beginning another. Everything we enjoy today was from the industrial civilization. That civilization built just about everything we see. Um, before that, of course, was the agricultural civilization. The information civilization is rising, and although it appears as if everything we enjoy we should hang on to, it's clear that it's run out of the energy it needs. It cannot deliver to today's 8 billion people, but certainly not by 2050, 10 billion people. And what you see is the rise of virtual technologies, distributed platforms around the world, the rise of AI. You see that fossil fuels can only deliver so much to actually fuel this new civilization. And our report talks about how we need to change the basis of everything we have if we're to create a prosperous civilization where everybody's a participant. The consequences of failure are, of course, enormous. And each one of us will feel them. We, we hear a lot about the climate catastrophe that is ahead if we don't change the basis on which we now grow. But there are many others, too. And each of those involves things like migration, uh, which affects all our lives, affects our politics, too. Um, it also affects the nature of geopolitics in the world and the conflicts that will happen. Um, but it affects also water and food uh, and the scarcity of natural resources and so on. So we're on this gap, if you like, where we have one foot in the 20th century, one in the 21st, driven by information, plenty, innovation, and breakthroughs. And we're resisting making this shift, taking one foot off. What tech has done, and throughout human history, but we plot some of the things that tech has delivered, it's helped us address food production and poverty and access to clean water and education and so on. And it's tempting to believe that these things happen just because civilizations progress. But they progress because the underlying technology, of course, spurred that. And what we're looking for is new technologies, which I think CS will display. You'll see them as you walk around the halls. All the seeds of those technologies already exist. 
And those technologies can actually propel this future. We analyzed 100 of the top tech companies in the world to look for what is it that they're doing? How do they see the future? What are all the technologies that are underlying their success? And what are the evidence strategies that are emerging? And what we found was as you plot them, you find that there are 19 core technologies that have been pursued by every major tech company in the world. A subset of those has the greatest emphasis. Those are things like AI. Um, those are digital technologies of various sorts. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. But it's clear that, that the tech industry is already staking out its future. It knows that we're at a point of massive wealth creation from these technologies. And so they're investing to build out new tech that will allow the future to be quite different from the past. Um, 19 of them, as I say, define this future. The strategies include the biggest tech companies who believe that if they stake out a claim in all 19, they've hedged their bets. And if they major on five or six of those, they will create the scale platforms that's, that actually grow just about everything that will, under, that will underpin our future civilization. There are a series of companies somewhat smaller that hope to do that, and there are much smaller companies that are picking specializations, five or six key specializations that they think will be the most valuable in the future. So the competition is actually very much on. Where does it all lead, though? We think it leads to three things if we're successful. The first is a planet that is more secure. A number of these technologies address security. Secondly, so many of these technologies uh, address sustainability. So if we're successful at building these technologies, it will be a more sustainable planet. More sustainable because there's food and there's water, there's access to education and so on, but a more sustainable planet. And the third is it's superior. It's functionally superior. Some of these technologies are not just digital, they're energy technologies. They're things like fusion. And the tech industry is playing quite a big role in the mass that underlies the building of fusion, of course. And so the tech industry has gone beyond digital, of course, into everything industrial, everything to do with physics. The AI is helping to spur all these ma massive innovations. Now, you might say tech is too important to leave to the private sector. And governments around the world actually believe that. So uh, if, if we step right back, what does it mean that 19 technologies might build the future? What does it mean that the biggest companies in the world, in the tech industry, are placing huge bets on these, these technologies? To understand what it means, we've stepped right back and said, what is the geopolitics of this change? And the geopolitics is that there is a, a transition going on in this change of civilizations that is bigger than just industries. It's countries. So if America has been the biggest power, there is a there is a plot here which shows you when does China potentially overtake America? When is the EU um, not one of the biggest marketplaces? Uh, how does India fit into that as one of the biggest countries with the most population on the planet? And, and what you see is somewhere in the next 30 to 50 years, there is a transition of powers and four great powers emerge, the US, China, the EU and India and between them, they seem to have cornered most of what the world needs to actually build the next civilization. We went a step further. We looked at 30 empires in history, and we plotted those two to see how long does someone get to run the world. And what you find is there are many, many lessons, and this is a plot of the 30. You find a few things. One is you get to run the world for a shorter and shorter period over time. So if you're the leader of the world, although it appears as if you might run it forever, it doesn't actually work that way. It seems as if you rise faster and you collapse much faster too. But underpinning every civilization in history was technology that gave it an edge over the previous civilization. And that's why these 19 technologies and the five or six that have been most heavily competed for are probably the basis of the next great power. The shift, of course, is clear. It's a shift from, in history, agriculture to industrial to information. And arguably, we're, we're well into this industrial age now. And all the seeds are laid and the technology is identified. 
the new technologies beyond the 19 are also identified, it seems, and people are already, already investing in those. So stepping back, and this is very detailed in the report, it's much easier to pick up, but I put it up just to illustrate that there are a few things to do. One is to look at the countries relative to the 19 technologies. And the other is to understand that technology is, of course, not, not the only basis of power. And so we looked at the GDP, the military spend, the capital markets, the economies, the populations, their indebtedness, and so on. And it reveals something quite interesting. It tells us that America is far ahead of everybody else. It has the biggest investments in these technologies, in these 19 technologies. It has the companies that actually are investing in these technologies. Even at the state level, it has massive budgets assigned to these technologies. China is level with the EU already along so many of these dimensions. But the EU is the biggest market and potentially gets to set the rules of how technology will be deployed in the biggest market in the world. India's at a nascent stage, but growing so rapidly and with 1.4 billion people rising to 1.6 by 2050, it's probably the biggest market in the world. And so it's a, these four are very important players. The US, despite its strength, of course, as we all know, has become very indebted, politically very divided, and they politicize the transition itself, which is one of the biggest drawbacks of being the leader, that most of the empires we showed you earlier, their fall is usually not from a competitor outside, but it's from a competition inside between different political factions. So despite all the enormous strengths of America leading in this next age, um, there is the drawback of the internal competition within America. We stepped back and said, but so what? You know, are there solutions which are already capable of solving the UN Sustainable Development Goals? The UN set 17 goals. They were set in 2015. Every country in the world signed up. The aim is to level up the whole world so that actually we have a, a platform that's equitable, where every country is a participant. The industrial age, just, just as a, a, a contextual point, brought, brought only one third of the world into prosperity. Two thirds are not participants. All of us are, I'm sure, but two thirds of the world is not a participant in the prosperity that was built. So the information age is the hope that actually we can deliver everything needed to bring the next two thirds on board. And our team uh, in Force for Good, our head of research, Chris Hansmeier is also here, uh, led some of the work with other members of the team around the world to look for 10 solutions. And what we found was there were 10 tech-enabled solutions. Some of them are, are pure tech, AI, universal connectivity, and so on. Others are industrial technologies. And yet more are ones that have been launched by governments. The Indian government, for example, launched a mass financial inclusion technology that allows half a billion Indians to open a bank account. That's very profound. Uh, the World Meteorological Organization has launched something which gives a pre-warning of a hazard event in the world. It's also very profound. But these 10 together can solve 50%, close 50% of the UN Sustainable Development Goal gap. So this gap is profound. We're, we're, we're nowhere near being able to solve it. But we believe these 10, if they were rolled out, well-funded across the world, would solve 50% of the gap. And we believe the tech industry is fantastically placed to take the top three, generative AI, universal connectivity, and mass financial inclusion, work with partners, and actually be the lead in solving the world's issues, backed by the right policies, the other stakeholders, of course, but make this big leap. Where does it all lead? We're on the brink of this shift. And this curve kind of show, shows us that if these 19 technologies are rolled out, the curve is so steep and so fast, and so steep upwards. Um, it would be expected that multiples of the current GDP will be created just based on these technologies, some of the next few decades. Uh, and this is the promise and the hope. This is why so many private sector companies, of course, should be enormously interested to take these opportunities, these technologies, and roll them out worldwide. But it's also why we believe that human security for all is a principle that needs to be the grounding principle of applying this technology. Gary Jacobs is also here from the World Academy of Art and Science and the head of the, the, um, the UN campaign 
for Human Security for All that works with the World Academy. Um, and so we're hoping that actually CS is another galvanizing event where technology rises to meet this great demand to solve the world's issues and make it more secure, more sustainable, and a far superior future for all. And if we do, every parameter of just about everything that we currently enjoy will change quite dramatically. How digital tech will impact us, energy that will be clean, abundant, near free, all of these things are within grasp. And probably a focus on these is our only way of not actually killing each other in large numbers, which we seem to be doing fairly well. One foot's in the 20th century, where combat and conflict was the way forward. And one foot in the 21st, where potentially innovation and building a better future is the way ahead. So that's where we are. Thank you. And I'm, I want to thank you very much, actually, for listening so patiently. And I'm going to introduce my two colleagues here, who are going to help us actually pick this all apart and see if we can take it all the way back to, um, they want me to keep this on, I think, but I'm going to turn it off so we can concentrate on, the, on my, my colleagues. So I'll start with Glenn Gaffney. Glenn, is, um, Glenn has a fascinating career. Glenn has uh, been the head of science and technology for the CIA, for the US government intelligence services. Uh, that was the first part of his career. Second part of his career, he was an investor. He looked at science and technology in laboratories all across the world to see if, if um, that could be taken and created commercially for use. Third part of his career, he's decided that it's the public sector and it's science and technology in the academies and all, and all the science units, plus the private sector, plus NGOs and others, could all work together to actually launch science and technology in the world to solve the biggest issues facing us. That's three parts to his career, which suits him very well to have this discussion with us. He continues to work in the diplomacy between Asia Pacific and America to see if there could be a transfer of knowledge um, and an agreement as to how we move forward together. Let me also introduce Walt. Walt Stinson um, is an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur. First part of his career was as an entrepreneur building something which took technologies from all over the world, but also Japan, consumer electroni electronics to bring it to the US and building a business out of that. He, that business was so successful, and the, um, the commitment he gained from so many entrepreneurs that were involved in that business meant he actually ended up uh, in, the in the Hall of Fame with uh, Steve Jobs. Um, he went on to, uh, to build another business, and um, is today also the chair of something called ProSource, which is a multi-billion dollar organization, sourcing um, and procuring for the tech industry and its entrepreneurs. Thirdly, he, he wears the hat of being on the board and the leadership team of Human Security for All this campaign and the World Academy of Art and Science. So has spanned entrepreneurism, commercializing that, of course, and also giving back to the world. Thank you very much. Um, let me start by asking Glenn a question. Glenn, you, you've heard the high-level story of how we see technology change in the world. Talk about your experience of the challenge you think we face um, in terms of security and sustainability, but also technology and, and this kind of double-edged sword that it is for us all. Well, thank you. Thank you, Katan. Um, I think the report is fantastic, so it, it's going to get uh, it's going to come out tonight, and I, I encourage everyone to read it and spend time with it. Um, it. It identifies the right technologies. It identifies the key pieces. I'm, I'm going to look at a subset of those. Um, we're going to talk about AI, right? Um, AI's got you know it, it's kind of sucking all the air out of the room these days. Uh, this last year, um, it's important to be sure it's critical in this space. But I think one of the things that's really important for us to do is understand that market forces left alone, delivering AI is not going to address the problems that we face. We actually have to bring a different group together on the industry side, the government side, the academic side, but also include the people, the consumers. And in this case, the consumers are the folks, not just the ones who are buying the product, but the consumers are the ones who are affected by every decision the AI or the machine learning program 
makes. There is a whole area of research that I believe that still needs to be done in order to move us forward productively and sustainably with the future of AI. And so one of the things that I think is really important is that governments, our government here in the United States, right, allied governments, develop proving grounds. Uh, proving grounds where we will look at AI applications in specific sectors and do both the technical research, the applied use cases, but also the, soci the, the sociological research. Bring the public into the process to determine and, and adapt a range of outcomes that are acceptable relative to those applications because it will change over time. But it's critical for developing trust and developing new markets and actually thinking about how we bring technology to those who are underserved and underrepresented, who in many cases need that technology most. So AI is critical and, and it's gonna fuel so many different things. Bio, I'm, I am so thrilled, I'm a physicist by, by background. I am completely um, captured by all of the opportunity that the future of biotech holds for us. In, all of these areas, in the material science area, in working climate change issues, in applying bio substrates into new technologies that will then reduce carbon emission and produce better products. Not to mention what it's, going, what it's doing and what it will continue to do for healthcare, right, um, and healthcare for all. But there's two pieces there that I think are connected underneath this, which is um, we need to focus on infrastructure and the technical infrastructure that enables the use of these tools and these technologies and, and focus on that globally. The security of that infrastructure is absolutely critical. And the application of AI in cybersecurity for these infrastructures I think is a critical piece that must be solved. We have the opportunity because in many of these places this infrastructure is new so we can actually develop the security that's necessary by design and not have to try to bolt it on afterwards like we have with, with every other industry. And lastly, power and energy. Um, these bio solutions that I'm so excited about, whether it's for food security or if it's for uh, lowering carbon emission or it is um, what we're doing on the healthcare side, they are all limited by one thing, which is affordable energy that's reliable right, and cost effective. That's an important point. It's a very important point because everything that underpins what we've talked about relies on an energy source. And our last energy source was fantastic as, a, as something that underwrote the Industrial Revolution, but it can't underwrite the next one. It can't take us in costlessly to space. You know, it, it can't take us cleanly to space. Um, well, same Before question. Before you ask me a question, yep. um, I'm sure everybody wants to know how they can get a copy of that report because the report is awesome. Um, my, um, I'm chairman of ProSource. We've got about 500 tech companies in ProSource. It's about a $3 billion organization. And so we talk a lot about what direction the industry's headed in. Um, and, and we just had a strategic planning session in uh, in California just last week, a couple of weeks ago. Um, you, you, we could you, have used that report. So how are we gonna get a, how are we gonna get a hold you, you, of that report? Tell us. So midnight tonight, you go to forcegood.org and you download it. Forcegood.org. Forcegood.org. Okay. www.forcegood.org. Okay. And you download it. Yeah. We, we, uh, there's a lot of IP there. We we have a background in the finance industry. I used to work for uh, one of the big investment banks. So we also look at capital as a powerful agent of, of making change. And so uh, our report just before the UN General Assembly in September is capital as a force for good. And so these two agents, capital and technology, are the big drivers underpinning most civilizations. And that's where we are today. We need these two to step up to the level of big civilizational level change. So, so it's 130 something pages long, right? It is, I'm afraid. There's a nice one page summary. Now. Yeah. All those charts are in there, right? <laughs> so all those charts are there. Okay. Uh, all the research is there. The appendices give you all the data sources, but all the charts are there summarizing huge amounts of work. Yeah, it's all there. Um, I just want to take a second to put all this in context. 
Last October, we had a, a, a ceremony at the United Nations headquarters. And uh, the head of CTA, Gary Shapiro, was there. And um, the, the tech envoy of the Secretary General of the UN, who's actually speaking here at CES uh, on Wednesday, um, was at this ceremony at which tech was recognized by human security for all as a pillar of human security. And this is a really amazing event because traditionally we look at security as being uh, the traditional components of human security measured at the individual level, their economic security, environmental security, health security, food security, personal security, community security, and political security. So what we've realized is that technology intersects with, underpins, and, and turbocharges all of those security elements. And if we're ever going to accomplish comprehensive human security, it's going to go, uh, be through the utilization of technology. That's what that ceremony was all about. And that's uh, why CES is themed on the concept of human security this year and focused on technology as a pillar of human security. So what does that mean to, to those of us that are making a living in the tech industry? Um, from my perspective, I'm very, very interested in AI. Um, I think that while technology can, can close the SDG gaps, and that means the sustainable development goals that 195 countries of the UN adopted in 1995 and that we're, um, we're, we're, we're going to fall short on. Technology can help us close that gap, but AI can actually and will probably uh, turbocharge us into the future, actually moving us beyond that gap into an era of prosperity that we can only imagine today. And that's if things go well. If things don't go well, then uh, we could find ourselves facing tremendous existential threats. And we haven't even begun to, um, to address those existential threats that require global cooperation in order to solve and, and uh, properly address. Uh, we haven't even come together as a, as a, as a world to decide whether we want AI to be our slave, to be our partner, or to be our master. Um, those questions ultimately have to be answered. There are all sorts of moral, philosophical implications associated with that. We really need to come together as, as a, a global community to address those issues. And um, uh, instead, as, as Katan pointed out, we're competing with one another. US is going to be competing with China. India is in the mix. Europe has its own uh, approach. And interestingly, I think Europe is going to be the one setting the regulatory standards for AI, whether or not those standards are going to be adopted by all of the various players in the AI space is yet to be seen. But um, but uh, because of the EU constitution and the way it favors privacy and individual privacy rights, it's likely that, that Europe is going to, to be at the lead there. Maybe Glenn can comment further on that. So this is, um, is there, this is exactly why I was talking about the need for governments, plural, industries, plural, right? Academia across all these countries to come together in a unique way to begin to work on these issues. Um, understanding what the unintended consequences may be from the human machine interface and the way that an AI system works and employs decisions in the in the space is absolutely critical for us to work together and then understand what the ramifications are of those decisions and how do we actually develop risk architectures that actually then move this whole thing forward in a way that's acceptable to society. And so if Europe is leading in the regulatory environment, that's great. All right, let's bring, let's bring the expertise that Europe is bringing, if they are working in these same kind of proving grounds, 
with proving grounds in the US and across other allies to begin to look at what I call the democratic principles of digital design. How do we actually think through right, what these potential outcomes are? You can't test every outcome. But as a group, you can begin to look at what is the condition that needs to be established for the way humans and machines will interact going forward, not just 20 years from now, but tomorrow. What does it mean in terms of autonomous vehicles? What does it mean in terms of cybersecurity? And when it, does a computer have the, then we should use the computers, we should use AI to do what machines do best, which is interpret the communications of other machines, which is the cyber industry. And the complexity of the security is, is far beyond right, what we can keep up with, but the machines can. But what happens when a machine decides that a preemptive strike is a better way to actually handle the security of a particular piece of infrastructure? Does it have a responsibility to do that? Does it have a responsibility to recognize that the human is in the loop and that when the human's in the loop, the human should be deferred to? These are important questions. Do we treat AI if it's, as if it's fundamentally right or that it's fundamentally wrong? These are questions that we can only answer by actually getting together and work through it. And in my experience in the national security community, um, what I think a lot of folks don't understand is that um, none of us do this alone. I've seen the quality of national and international research and development and different regulatory groups and integrating capabilities across nations in order to deliver some of the things that are most important for our security. I think we can do it. I know we can do it, right, for the security and for the good of all. I, I think that's really powerful because um, when we identified these 10 solutions, Glenn, we found ourselves saying, um, why aren't they getting rolled out? You know, ev everything we've created is really designed, in terms of tech solutions, is designed for a third of the world. Why isn't it going to the others? And you realize there's something stopping us rolling them out. Some of that is policy. Some of that is the conditions aren't right. Some is the infrastructure isn't there and so on. But actually, in very poor countries where we've seen technology rolled out, all of a sudden, hundreds of millions of people who were poor, unbanked, and were just seen almost as if, as if they were a liability for the country, became an asset. They became productive. They're an asset. They're employed. They create financial value. Now they're customers. And I think we're on that brink where another five to six billion people are about to become valuable customers. And technology enables that because the cost of service goes down quite dramatically. Absolutely. I think it's important, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, with the opportunity to build new infrastructure to enable some of these key technologies, is the opportunity to actually think about the security and the implement implementation from the design phase rather than try to figure it out afterwards. How many times within the cybersecurity industry have we said, if we can only start over, but we deal with sunk cost that becomes an obstacle to then adopting new technology? Yeah, yeah. We don't have that here, so I see the opportunity to do the infrastructure piece and the rest of the world as real opportunity, right? Um, to learn and to develop and then figure out how you then move from what we have to what we should have going mm -hmm. forward. And Walt, you've seen that in the consumer space too. You've seen people adopt things that it, it wasn't clear which standard might win, which technology might get adopted, but that shift has happened. How do you see that applied looking ahead? Are things like AI, you know, delivered, delivering something that's useful but secure, sustainable, and so on? Well, first of all, I, I really feel lucky to um, be at this, at, here at CES at this moment in time. Um, I've been, this is my 50th CES, oh. and um, when I first started coming to CES, everything was analog. We didn't have any digital products at all. Um, and so when the digital revolution came along, I thought this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to hitch my wagon to a transformative technology that's going to uh, change the world. And here we are sitting up here on stage talking about a, a, a transformative technology that's going to change the world, and that's AI. And 19, maybe, and AI on top of that. Right? Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. 
So what I see is I, I see every, every digitally connected product, every digital product powered by AI. That's a future that I see. So every product has to change. Everything that connects to the internet has to change. Um, every manufacturer that makes uh, an Internet of Things product is going to have to, to partner with an, an, an AI company because we can't all develop AI. We, we see the resources that it takes to develop AI, the money, uh, the, the talent that it takes to develop AI. But of course, these things will be licensed out. Um, and so just as uh, Sony has partnered with Google to uh, have a Google-powered TV set, we're going to see products that are uh, powered by AI. And it's going to be a very exciting time because it will transform every product that we use. It's going to transform our lives. And, and hopefully, it will make us more secure. Uh, it should enable us to be more efficient, more productive. Um, certainly, we hope that the economies of the world will grow as a consequence of, of embracing AI. But there are also going to be disruptions associated with AI. And maybe you can talk a little bit about those disruptions, or Glenn can. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's estimated yeah. that, that maybe 30 million people in Europe alone will be displaced as a consequence of the adoption of AI uh, over time. And uh, that's going to have significant repercussions at the political level and, uh, and, and, and could affect uh, uh, the, the politics and, and, and on an international level and also on a local level. I think, I think you're absolutely right, Walt. And look, uh, I, I um, made a calculation error in terms of how much time we have. I thought we had 10 minutes more, but we don't. So, so what I was going to say was, um, in, in terms of the, uh, the disruption, it's potentially huge. And especially because it's not just uh, one technology that's changing. It's almost the whole suite underlying us is about to become an intelligent suite of technologies. And when that changes, you know, everything changes in terms of our jobs, our relationships with each other, between individuals, communities, countries. You know, everything's about to change. And so it's quite, a, it's quite a difficult transition. And there are winners and there are lots of losers out of this until we figure out where it settles. And so um, that calls for s some measure of leadership, political leadership, community leadership. And with that missing, it, it, relate, it causes conflict. I think it also we're in that has, transition. I think it also has a real implication um, for education yeah. and the development of the next generation workforce. Um, because if we're going to develop the talent that's actually going to sustain the breakthroughs, then they need to be training with machines now. Right? It, and they need to learn now that it's not just about data accumulation. It's about knowing how to ask the right question and how to test the result. It's the critical thinking aspects of it, not just the amass, the amass the, uh, of, of data and knowledge around that piece. There's opportunity as we have humans and machines learning together. Um, and I think that opportunity uh, needs to be factored in to what is perceived as an incredible job loss as AI comes forward and replaces a lot. There will definitely be replacement. I'm not saying that, that it's not going to happen. I'm saying that there's also opportunity um, from expertise from the human beings working hand in hand with the machines learning together. Our time is nearly up. Just um, give us a final statement, just each of you, on. Why are you positive, though, this level of change at this point? Why, why are you intrinsically positive about the future? Well, this is, an, this is an evolution of our civilization. And all evolutions of civilization, uh, they certainly look fraught with peril when you're looking ahead at them. And when you're looking back, um, they look inevitable. And I think this will look that way. Thank you. Glenn. I'm confident we will get there because it's mankind. And it's that evolution piece that Walt talked about. What I am passionate about is getting there quickly and efficiently and effectively 
right? Um, to help the rest of the world in these spaces and to help ourselves in the process. I'm optimistic because I've seen it work at so many different levels across the globe. What we need to do is prioritize the work right, to elevate these pieces and then invest in it. And again, it's not just government, it's government, industry, academia, together, multi, multi nations. Wonderful. I, I, I'm going to encourage you to do something as you go through CES in these next few days, which is um, look at it afresh. Whatever you see with AI added to it is something much more powerful than it was whether it's ed tech, fintech, um, something that delivers water or food or anything. It's just a different order of magnitude. Um, I have another hat, which is uh, as an investor um, and the, the founder CEO of an investment firm. And our team, uh, one of our team is here to go through CES, looking at everything afresh, saying, what is here that could actually be an, be an investable opportunity added with AI added could be completely much more powerful. Um, and so I think it's a great opportunity to relook at CES through that lens. So I hope you enjoy that too. Thank you very much.